semi-annual event around here. We're going to take a group picture. So, you know, brush your teeth. If you're not very photogenic, just kind of, I always slide right behind somebody just before the camera goes off. So uh, that we're, we're looking forward to that. Also, um, if you have personal items here, every if you think moving a house is tough, I told someone earlier this process has been like buying and selling 40 homes at once. It really has. Uh, every time we move a church, it's a, it's a monumental event. And I know that uh, uh, a lot of us have personal items here. Um, uh, some of those have almost certainly already been accidentally packed, and I apologize for that. If you have a, a world of those, it's a long list. If you have personal things here in your Sunday school class or your work area that you want to handle, now's probably the time to get them, and uh, uh, everything is going to uh, uh, be boxed, moved, and stored. Also, uh, if you have keys that you're going to need between now and move time to pack, we definitely want you to keep those. We're going to do our best to collect all the keys we can for the church coming in we're going to try to do everything for them that we're hoping Oakland Heights is going to do for us and so uh, if you if you have keys that you don't need uh, we'll start taking those in the office after service today and uh, that will be tremendous and I think I've got just about everything out on that our growth rate's been so tremendous I'm not positive that we got everybody on our remind apps to get the group text or if you're not on the church members Facebook page or, or you know the robocalls and all that please let us know we want to make sure that happens I'm sure I forgot something that's a lot and uh, whatever I forgot you probably wouldn't have remembered it anyway we got to pray everyone here goes deaf at announcement time it's astounding if I've ever got to confess something I'm ashamed of I'm going to slip it right in the middle of announcements and nobody will even know Amen. the book of Judges chapter 16 Judges chapter 16 we're going to begin with verse number 26. I uh, was on a flight Thursday morning and saw the sunrise in the air. And while I was watching the sun come up, my mind turned not to sunrises, but to sunsets. We're such busy people. We're such distracted people. So many things vying for our time. It's unbelievable. Oftentimes, sunset catches us unaware. We weren't planning for it. We weren't thinking about it. In life, it just sort of creeps up on you. The best time to think about sunsets, not really in the late evening, it's in the early morning. When we start prioritizing the things I've just got to do today. Psalm 65, my favorite translation of this says, They who dwell at the ends of the earth stand in awe of your sign. You make the dawn and the sunset shout for joy. I want sunset when it comes to my life to be a thing of joy. Now we're not doing anything, we're, we're just moving buildings. I've been making a list what have I just got to do before we get out of here? And then I started remaking my life list and my or, or church list. What have I, what, what's got to happen before sunset? Because it's coming. I've lived certainly statistically over half my days, and I mean, it's coming. It's coming. I don't want to depress anybody, but you are temporary. Your soul is eternal, and your life is temporary. It's coming. Here Samson is approaching the sunset of his life. We're not going to take the time to talk about the anointing of God on his life or how he squandered it or what he gave away or what it cost him. Here he is now blinded, imprisoned by the people. God raised him up to defeat. The Bible says in Judges 16, 26, And Samson said unto the lad that held him by the hand, Suffer me that I may fill the pillars whereupon the house standeth that I may lean on them. I'm blind. This, this kid they've assigned to haul me around. Will you just take me to the pillars that hold this place up? 27. 
Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there. There were upon the roof about 3,000 men and women that, beh- that beheld while Samson made sport. In the middle of that humiliation, Samson called unto the Lord and said, O oh Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once, O oh God. That I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. Another translation said, God, I pray, help me one more time. Help me one more time. Today, looking at sunsets, I want to talk to us about one more time let's ask him to help us god i love you thank you for your goodness thank you god for your word for i am woefully imperfect but this is a perfect book god i am woefully inadequate and your spirit is perfection personified i pray now that you help us individually and collectively to log out of the news cycle not to worry about this messed up world around us but for the next few seconds that we would just think about you turn our eyes to you turn our focus to you god i want you to use and help and change and bless and interact with me I want to leave here God more like you than I am right now show yourself mighty we pray in Jesus name amen 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 hallelujah you may be seated Bible says be ye angry and sin not we're a lot better at being mad than we are at not sinning while we're mad Then he said, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. It may just be because I've been in a reflection mode lately. Looking at my rapidly grown up kids. Two out of three grown up, one's threatening to. I'm pulling for them. Thumbing through pictures of just how much has changed. In the few years our, our church family's been in this particular facility and looking back and thinking back and, and, and it's unbelievable and, and, and reminding myself as I've tried to do all my life of my own mortality so that I don't squander my days and then of course the prophetic clock ticking down around us that really started on May 10th of 1948 when Israel became a nation again things were set in motion irreversibly and I don't fear that I am excited about it we're living in, in a powerful prophetic time but I think it's it's appropriate every now and then that we just step back and we look at our life and we look at our family and we look at our relationship with God that we look at our marriage that we look at our church that we look at our calling that we look at the work of God in our life and the work for God with our life and our own vision and ask ourselves every now and then if I know the sunset's coming is this enough I know sunset's coming. If it's today, is that all right? Is it the way I want it to be? Or as I stare down sunset, if I had a one more time opportunity, what do I need to be different? If I had my one more time opportunity, what do I need to be better? The scriptures talk a lot about sunset. Every time we find ourselves discussing them in service, it's it's amazing to me because the day can be so unpredictable. I've woken up on on particular mornings with with no unusual plans and ended up having to be on the other side of the country because unbelievably unpredictable things happen. Sometimes tremendous things and sometimes tragic things. You never really know what's going to happen when your phone rings. The duration of the day can put you in distressful places, in 
frustrated places. It, it can put you in destructive places and difficult places and, and times of defeat that would devour you. The day is long. It can be hot or cold. It is always unpredictable. How many times have we talked about the Apostle Paul when he dipped his pen in, in, in ink and he's writing to that young evangelist that he's mentored and, and, and discipled and tried to help and prepare and watch God use. And he was talking about his own sunset and he said, I have fought the good fight. I have kept the faith and I have finished the course with joy. Notice Paul. He said, I've kept the faith and I finished the course. Paul couldn't say, I've kept the course. The apostle Paul that wrote over half of our New Testament couldn't say, I did it all right. I'm satisfied with this. Everything was perfect. Man, from the time God pulled me out of the gutter, I made this work and I'm pleased. No, everybody stumbles off course. Paul, Paul, Paul couldn't say I kept the course. He didn't. But he did say I just kept fighting and I kept the faith. When I messed it up, it didn't change how I saw him. When I dropped the ball, it didn't change how I felt about him. I did not keep the course, but I finished the course. We've got to realize that sunset's coming. And honey, we have to be a people with our mind on finishing. You are going to stumble. I am going to slip. We are all going to make our mistakes. But you can't let the sunset in your life until we grab those proverbial columns and say, God, one more time before I let this slip through my hands. I need you to work in me and on me and through me. Mornings, they can go by so fast. And they can drag on so long. So we work our way through the afternoons, variations, wild vacillations, contradictions, and oppositions. Stuff can happen to turn you upside down and inside out. We're living in a day unlike our ancestors. Look at the picture of... My grandmother, she's, 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 uh, she's 93. She quit working two years ago. She's starting to slow down, you know. And, and, and she has this, this old picture of some of her people. And I always marvel when I look at them. They're all just, just tiny. They grew up in a world where starvation was a real thing. And they were all small because you start working when you start walking. And you work until you can't walk anymore. And it's not like me when I'm keeping terrible hours. A lot of it's in a truck and on a phone and at a desk. Honey, they worked. But in the process of that grinding life, never forget the excerpt from the diary when they were digging the Erie Canal. I dig in the ditch to get the money to buy the beefsteak to get the strength to dig in the ditch to get the money to buy the beefsteak to get the strength to dig in the ditch to get the money to buy the beefsteak to get the strength to dig in the ditch and we just do that from the time we start until we're absolutely finished and if we're not careful we're just going to react to life and we're going to react to life until we run out of life and now we're living in a day when we're so spiritually divided and so culturally divided there are two kinds of people in this room there are people who are going to be mad because of what one side says and does in this next presidential election and there are people who are going to be mad because of what the other side says and does during this presidential election we're living in a day when you look at just, 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 just mainstream news. If you're not careful, if you're not careful, you'll spend all your days so angry at sinners for sinning that we forget the purpose of the love of God in our life and we lose that internal battle. And honey, I'm not talking about laying down. I'm not talking about sidestepping or shirking responsibilities. I mean, I've got to realize there's a sunset coming in my life and I need to take my inadequacies and my incompletions and those voices voids in my soul and allow God to rectify it before I go off the scene. Daniel, where's Daniel? Is he in here? Daniel was an arts view kid. He started acting when he was uh, uh, about 12 years old. Matter of fact, I'll never forget, uh, uh, he got like the lead male role in, in, in his first one, which was crazy because these poor other kids have been acting a long time and it turns out he's just really good at being fake. 
And one time they reached out, they, they talked to us, but, uh, matter of fact, I got something in the mail, because they, they, were, they were pushing this Disney Channel audition, and, and I, I looked at your mom, and I said, absolutely not, I don't even think we told you about that. I said, he's 13, the worst thing in the world that could happen to him. You talk about a train wreck. He was a pretty good actor. He was natural. I still don't know if I trust him or not, because, I mean, he just, you know. Then his sister who actually was the kid that wanted to be the theater kid. The Arts Food Children's Theater for a long time had her as the evil queen dropping poison into a vat as their marquee advertisement. I noticed you were always the lead female villain for years. After your mother, that's what she said, not me, but we're, I want that on the video. And then Joel, where's Joel at today? Joel came along. He's still acting. <laughs> We're not going to get into that. Uh, yeah. Their dad was never much of an actor. All three of them were. Once one started, it was kind of a domino effect. I don't know a lot about acting. I mean, I know you're not supposed to turn your back on the audience and, I, and blah, 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 blah. But I do remember this from school. One principle of drama is entrances are brief and exits are eternal. How you come on the stage and set the tone, it matters. But you're forever remembered by how you go off. You're not really remembered for how you start. You're immortalized by how you finish. In so many funerals, I've talked about how we're just born a, a baby boy or a baby girl. Uh, babies are born loved because they exist, not because of their personality or their contributions or their accomplishments, just because they're here and they're yours. But when we hold a funeral, we hold those for moms and dads and husbands and wives and aunts and uncles and doctors and lawyers and ditch diggers. We, we hold funerals for people. None of us have any control over when we're born or where we're born or how we're born or the fact family we're born into or the timeline we're born into you have no control over your start but it ends right there honey you have absolute control over what you do with your days and I want to remind somebody who feels like your life is upside down and inside out the sun is still shining on you you can absolutely change I hope you're in the house of the Lord today because you know he can change you he can be the energizing change in your life. God is not finished. I told this story in the old sanctuary. It's once a preaching a, a morning event, and these preachers are having breakfast, and I realize what what my problem's been all my life. One of those guys, his daughter had just turned sixteen. This happened twenty years ago, I think, and he had bought her a brand new Mercury Cougar. And right then and there, while I was trying to, trying to get eggs to my mouth, I stopped and I realized what's messed me up. I chose the wrong dad. I didn't get a brand new Mercury Cougar. I bought the first new car I ever had. I got a Toyota about the size of this pulpit. It was used and old. It was a four-speed manual transmission. I'll interpret that later. And, I mean, it, it had four doors. I still had it when we met. It had four doors, but you could hardly put four people in it. One time when I was 16 or 17, I took six or eight kids to a prayer meeting. We had a boy in the trunk. It was a terrible idea. <laughs> Youth group would pick the car up, three or four guys, and just move it somewhere. It was undrivable every now and then if they were aggravated at me. I was thinking about my car when I got it, the paint was peeling off the hood. My dad bought it very used and still had him take the radio out. I said, Dad, there's no radio. He said, no, you need to save some money, then decide if it's worth it. He said, that's how life works. He, he paid to take the radio out. He paid to take the radio out. And I'm looking at this 
this, this, this man, and I'm sure his daughter was a tremendous kid, and, and I should have been happy for her, but all at once, I'm just sad for me. I thought, man, not everybody gets a dad like that. I probably didn't need a dad like that. Now, I can chuckle because I had no more input over who my dad was than you have over who your mom was. But, honey, that's absolutely where it stops. As if we're ever going to get anywhere in life, we've got to realize everybody's messed up. And we all came from a different kind of dysfunctional. And I can either lay down in my depression and justify my situation and build a a, a nice comfortable nest of why I'm not ever going to be any better. And I can decide to have a victim mentality for the rest of my days I can lay on my past and blame my history or I can wake up and realize that my decisions and what I let God do in my life determine my tomorrows and I'm not going to squander tomorrow laying down to lament yesterday you can't unring those bells you can't unring those bells you can't unbreak those vases but you're in the house of the Lord and there's daylight in your life I've said this before there are two kinds of two kinds of Christians we're a lot like breakfast cereal some people man they just like to soak up the milk and get soggy and sink to the bottom of the bowl I mean you tell them what God's doing and they'll come up with a real good reason of why he didn't do it sooner and he's not gonna do it there and how it's not gonna matter anyway I'll never forget the first hundred soul revival I preached I was talking to this sweet, cantankerous person after church. And I said, can you believe that? She said, yeah, but I've been around a long time. Half of them will backslide the next two years. I said, I sure want you praying for me. You know, God can, God can heal you of cancer. I said, yeah, but I'm going to get old and die anyway. I mean, you know. Inherit a million dollars. Yeah, but just think of the taxes I'm going to have to pay. Probably lose my food stamps. See, here's the deal. Some people soak up the milk and sink to the bottom of the bowl. And others are, they're Rice Krispie Christians. It doesn't matter what you pour on them. They just snap and crackle and pop. Because here's the deal, honey. Life comes to all of us. And we can either marinate or elevate. And somewhere along the line, we've got to make our decision. It may not have started well. And it may not be going well. But it's not over yet. And God's never done anything for anybody that he can't do for me. He's never done anything anywhere that he can't do right here. John was that kind. John was boiled in hot oil alive. He survived. So he was banished. They dumped him out on a rock to die in the elements in the middle of the Mediterranean. I've always pictured buzzers circling overhead. It was an island of death. He picked up his pen in his 80s, boiled, hurting, and alone. And he said, I, John, was in the spirit on the Lord's day. He had lived through the trouble and the trial. He's aching, but he's not breaking. He said, I may be boiling in a bad situation, but honey, I'm not going to end my life bitter and broken. I want to touch God right where I am. I've caught some bad breaks, but he can touch me right where I am. Everybody's just got to get it in their head every now and then. I've messed it up for decades, but I don't have to let it in like this I'm not gonna let it end like this this is not the way that it's going to end I'm down but I won't always be down I'm far from God but I won't always be far from God I'm broken but I won't always be broken God is so different than we are everything that's manufactured goes from good to bad Man, that nice, shiny, new red truck. I told him we pulled off the parking lot. You better breathe deep because it's all downhill from here. In the middle of Grace and Lawson's wedding. Standing right here. I told her, I said, take a good look because, honey, it's all downhill from here. 
build that shiny new house, you better walk through and take pictures. Because stuff's going to age and rust. Everything we do starts good. And then it deteriorates. But God doesn't work that way at all. From the very beginning, he wanted us to know that it's not that way with him. I believe that's why in the Genesis account of creation, he didn't say the morning and the evening were the first day. He said the evening and the morning were the first day. And the evening and the morning were the second day. And the evening and the morning were the third day. Because my day ends with the sun going down. But honey, God's calendar ends with the sun coming up. That's how it worked in the very beginning that's how it worked when he went to Calvary the sunset was not the end of the story it was the beginning he said for the son of righteousness shall be revealed with healing in his hands the world's gonna get in bad shape if you thumb through Bible prophecy you think it's scary now honey we got problems coming up but I'm not concerned about this New Testament church it doesn't end with a sunset it ends with a resurrection it ends with a sunrise God is going to take care of his own now I discovered something a long time ago church works better if I just tell you what I'm trying to do it may shock you to learn that I come to the pulpit with an agenda I do friend of mine friend of mine after uh, after church one day his four-year-old said dad what you preached about today did that really happen or were you just preaching I'm not just preaching. I want to tell you, it's not complicated. God's God for everybody everywhere. You've got to get some grit back in your back and determination in your mind and a heart not just full of repentance but hope. It may be hot in the middle of the day, but honey, your sun has not set yet. It doesn't have to end this way. I preached an entire message one time. About the founding of the game of rugby. Years ago, an aging, what we would call soccer player. He, 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 had, he, had, he had done well for years and he'd never just never quite won the big one. The time was running out on his career. And with a tie, they could clinch the league and the trophy. He wanted it so bad. But it wasn't to be. They drug, fell behind early and stayed behind throughout the entire. They were in added time. The final whistle was inevitable and it just wasn't to be. And while the ball was sailing over his head in the air, he leaped up and he grabbed it. He plucked it from the air and ran down the field and slammed it with his hands into the goal. And their crowd went crazy, but the goal was to no avail because he had violated the rules. But in that moment, a brand new game was born that they called rugby, from which we developed our own football. And it all started. It didn't work for him, but it just started with that desperate plea I just cannot accept that things are going to end this way I wish that we would stop being such an accepting people and something would just creep down into the depths of our soul here we are one more time in the house of the Lord I can't let the sun set in my life while my kids are lost I can't let the sun set in my life while my spirits this dead I can't let the sun set in my life with my marriage in this kind of shape I can't let the sun set in my life while my my calling is unfulfilled. The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent taketh by force. Samson, in our text, had gone from killing the multitudes of the God's enemies with a gate to now he's blinded, his fault. He's bound, his fault. And he's walking in circles, grinding at the mill, making bread for the enemies of God, for Israel's oppressors. It's exactly, it's exactly, it's exactly where hell would have you and me and us. Bound with no spiritual liberty. You ever been somewhere and just not felt liberty? Not felt safe? Not felt free? Not felt at home? We take it for granted. We live in a nation with a Bill of Rights. It may not be a good idea, but you can say whatever you want. 
in nearly every other Western country in the world, places like England and Canada, you can be prosecuted for what you say. So you don't have the right. There is no Bill of Rights there. You can't just say whatever you want. So much worse when you feel bound in your spirit. Bound with no liberty. Blind with no vision. Oh, it's so frustrating to stumble through life. The Bible says where there's no vision, the people perish. Those of you living without vision, you're bound to what you can feel. You ever been around a blind person? They, 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 they've got to stay in their familiar zone. I know how many steps it is. I know how many steps it is. I know how many. I told the story one time preaching about vision of, uh, uh, of the country music singer Ronnie Millsap. I was once in a, in a doctor's office waiting for three and a half hours. And so I read every magazine in there three times. I learned stuff I didn't know I needed to know. And I read this article about Ronnie Millsap, blind country singer back in the day. And they, they, they asked about uh, his marriage. He said, oh, it's wonderful. We don't ever fight. She just rearranges the furniture, and I apologize. <laughs> because when he's in the familiar zone, he knows how many steps it is to the fridge. He knows how many steps it is to the microwave. He knows how many steps it is to the chair. He lives in the familiar. So when she gets upset, she just shuffles stuff. And he gets over being mad real fast. They said, how'd you two meet? He said, she was working at a recording studio. When it was time for a lunch break. Uh, uh, my, my guy had to be gone and she offered to drive me. We got to the parking lot and she said, let's race. The loser buys lunch. She didn't tell him there was a panel van parked in the middle of the parking lot. So at three, they both ran. He found the van, hit the ground, full tilt. She came back and checked on him and informed him he had lost. He said, right then I was in love. Because everybody else treated me like a rich, famous, blind person. And she never did. He talked about life without vision. When you have no vision, you have to stay in what you're familiar with and comfortable with. And the only time you can get outside of that is when somebody takes you by the hand and leads you. Or, or you just sort of feel your way around. Honey, when we have no vision, we're like Samson. We just walk in circles, chained to the boat. I, I want to tell you, when I can't feel a thing and I can't figure out what's going on, vision, it helps you get from point A to point B. If you can see it, then you can navigate it. You've got to get your eyes up and fixed on him. If you live as a feeling junkie or an emotional junkie, you're never going to make progress in your relationship with God. Here he is bound and blind and going round and round. But something began to change inside of him. He had lost it all through disobedience when he told Delilah about his, his covenant with God. He couldn't cut his hair. When she shaved it off, he woke up powerless. But now the Bible said the hairs of his head began to grow. See, I don't look at people and wonder if they can pull the gate off the city or stand up to a thousand Philistines at once. Honey, if I can see some sprouts coming in your life, it fills me with hope because we're all in trouble when we stop sprouting. Something just began to happen inside. We've got to get that in our spirit. I thank God for what he's done here. But honey, you better believe I'm convinced. I'm praying about it. We haven't seen our biggest revival yet. I hope I haven't preached my best sermon yet. I, I can talk about what God's done in my life all day long. But I have to believe the better is before and not behind. You don't have to be like you are. You don't have to feel the way you feel or live the way you're living. That's why we're here. Samson told that boy, take me to the pillars. He led him there. He put his hands on those columns. I can't let it in like this. This just isn't enough. God, one more time. I'm not asking you to give me the years I wasted back. One more time. Will you just let me feel your presence? One more time. 
Will you put your hand on me? One more time. I need your power in my life. Because I can't let it end like this. The sun can't set. Oh, I, I can say it a million ways. You hear me, sir, ma'am. You've got to get up off the mat. It does not have to be the way it is. You may have wasted your morning and you may have goofed up the afternoon, but the sun hasn't set yet. You have to get up. You can get up. Jesus Christ died and rose again so you can get up. He poured his spirit out in the beginning so that you can get up. We've just got to get it inside of us. I can't let the sun set. I haven't got my miracle yet. I'm not spirit filled yet. I. Um... <sighs> Joshua had the battle going his way. They're conquering the Amalekites, they're rolling them up. Their adversaries are fleeing. He had victory within his grasp. He got so distracted in the battle, he wasn't keeping up with the time. He realized the sun was setting. And it hit him all at once, oh no. If I let them slip into the night, we won't ever bring them to a pitch battle again. And then they'll just, keep, they'll just keep growing their culture. And my kids will have to fight them. And my grandkids will have to fight them. And my great-grandkids will have to fight them. This won't work. This cannot happen. I, I can't allow this to be. I can't let the sun set while my battle is half won. And he said something so interesting. It had never been said before. But he just couldn't accept sunset under these circumstances. And the Bible says he walked out in the sight of all Israel he didn't care who heard him he wasn't shy and he said son stand still and moon stay where you are and for a moment he was practically the ruler of the universe because the Bible said it all froze. God stopped the entire celestial system, the orbit of the earth. Because one man said it can't stop. I haven't won yet. There were two men who grew up in a church. Neither one of them stuck. They both left it before they were grown. They had a lot of conflict with each other and everybody else. They both happened to get under conviction at the same time and randomly show up in adulthood to the same service. One sit over here, one sit over there, they glared at each other. They both came because they knew they needed the Lord, but when they saw the other person, they got so upset at somebody else, they couldn't let Jesus help them. I wish I had some time for that. How foolish is that? So... Church was about to wrap up. Somebody ran up and said, Pastor, there's a fight in the parking lot. It's not something you often hear at church. He went out expecting to find boys or teenagers maybe. No, it's these two guys. One's in the truck and the other's got his hands on him. He walked over and he grabbed him. He said, Wally! You have to stop this. He said, hold on, brother. I'm not finished yet. <laughs> I don't know if it's quite the same. But Joshua just wasn't finished. Now, anybody here who went to elementary school knows that Joshua was all out in left field. Because the sun doesn't rotate around the earth. The earth rotates around the sun. When he says, son, stand still, God could have looked down and lectured and said, you little dingbat, it is standing still. You don't even know what to pray for. You need an astronomy class. You need a science class. If you're not careful, you think God is, is a college professor who's judging your paper and not using a curve. That he's trying to teach you something to see if you get a C or a D or an F or a B. And none of us are going to get an A. But that's not how it works at all. You don't have to have a clue what you really should say. And sometimes you don't have to have a clue what you really should do. He looked down into the heart of that man and said, you've got no clue what you're talking about, but I know what you mean. I can see your tears. I can see your passion. I can 
can see your heart. And I'm not giving you what you asked for. I'm going to give you what you need. Let me say it again. Honey, if you turn your heart toward him, this doesn't all have to make sense to you. You don't have to be able to explain it all. You can just step right out in the big middle of it and lift your eyes and heart to him. And today, he can help you. Let's stand together. Sunsets come to all people. Some come sooner than others. I've known people who left this world in the middle of the work day, prepared to put a golf ball to a preacher who fell over in the pulpit. But most of us statistically will one day occupy a deathbed. Gives you something to look forward to. When that day comes, I'll have four things with me. My relationship with God or the lack thereof. It matters now so much, it'll matter more then. If you're blessed, and we're not all blessed like this, not all up to you if you do it right you'll have people around you who love you I'm bribing you now because somebody's got to wipe the drool off my chin later if our mind's clear and it's not always we'll have memories thank God for them if you're going to find out, Georgia, honey, that girl's going to be so cute now so you don't strangle her when she's 16. God knew what he was doing the whole time. And then you'll be there. You. Yourself. Inescapably. Unavoidably. Memories. Family. But you. You. Can I ask you today, are you the person that you want to be when you're preparing to leave this world and stand before God? You, right now, if because that day comes, I mean, it comes like a freight train. Right now, do you have a dispute with someone you love that when you look at it in those, in those terms, it's just kind of silly? Right now. Is this the way you want it to end? Right now. Are you estranged from anybody that you'd maybe fix it if you had 30 days to live? Because I want to tell you, you probably won't know when you have 30 days to live. When I'm facing a decision, I step back and say, if I knew I was going to stand before God in 90 days, how would I handle this? And that's usually the way I should handle it. Right now. Can I ask you? Do you feel disconnected, backslid in your heart of hearts? Are you going to let the sun set like this? We're here because we have daylight. We have one more time. Don't know if I'll ever get another one, but I've got this one. I've got this one. And God can do anything. Hey, you may have had a rough day, honey. Your sun hasn't set yet. That's why you're here. Are you going to let it end the way it is? Maybe you don't even know exactly what to pray for. But God, I know this isn't working. And I know I need something different. That's okay if you'll talk to him just like that. The psalmist said, he will perfect that that concerneth thee. There are things that sometimes I'm so burdened for. And I'm not sure how to touch them without making them worse. And I'm thinking thinking about it and I'm pondering it and I'm praying about it and then I watch God just crawl right down in the middle of it. I'm convinced if it concerns you, it'll concern him. Is there anything bothering you enough that you can bring it to him? God tarries in a week We'll gather in this room for the last time. The odds are almost certain that when we gather for the last time ever, we're not going to know it. I don't want to waste it. I don't want to 
what a waste. And I don't want the sun to set until it's done. Can we lift our hands to them together right now? Come on. Oh God, right now in the name of Jesus, you see your people. Oh God, these people that you love and you died for. I'm asking that you help us to search our hearts, search our thoughts. God, to search that inward man. Oh.